So, dark tourism or Bosnian screen, which quite interestingly it will be a slightly different interpretation to what Tomasz provided. Um, hopefully it will be similar in some ways, but I'll have to talk about it later on, maybe over lunch. So, um, to begin with, let's think back to Emil Kostovic's iconic 1985 film, Opus and Sultan Porto, which is a work with a distinctly Bosnian set in the late 1940s and it portrays multi-ethnic urban Sarajevo featuring an ensemble of Muslim, Serb and Croat characters who are shown to have varying degrees of allegiance to the Yugoslav state. Moreover, the ethnicities of the star-studded cast didn't always match those of the characters that they were playing. So whilst Croat Mira Fordalan plays a Bosnian Croat, Serbs Mika Manojlovic and Mirjana Karanovic uh, play a Bosnian couple. The multi ethnic quality of Bosnian cinema prior to the 1990s, when film production was abruptly halted due to the war, has subsequently been replaced by a mono ethnic Bosnian national cinema since its renewal in the 2000s, as Bonash said himself. Films made in Bosnia since, uh, since then have overwhelmingly focused on the war and the consequences from a mono ethnic Bosnian perspective rather than a multi ethnic Bosnian uh, viewpoint. What I'll suggest in this paper is that whilst Bosnia has uh, struggled to attract the uh, conventional tourists in the same way as Croatia, lacking the crystal clear seas and UNESCO cities of its neighbours' Dalmatian coastline, success of its cinema is instead akin to a different form of tourism, that of dark tourism. But how did we get to this? Well, during the 1990s there's a fracture in Bosnian cinema production, feature film production that is caused by the war. For several years, there are no domestic releases whatsoever, the war leaving a decimated industry uh, once peace was eventually reached. Coupled with the damage inflicted upon broader society, this provoked a change in ideology. Those who were in a position to do so sought their fortunes elsewhere. So Bosnian Croats such as Antonio Nuic and Goran Bogdan and went to Zagreb. Uh, likewise, Bosnian Serbs like Natasha Ninkovic and Nikola Pejakovic would head to Belgrade. They were joined by Eme Kustarica, who I mentioned earlier as the director of Opus and Sultan and Pultu, who was now disavowing his uh, Sarajevan identity and even converting to Serbian Orthodoxy to uh, serve the very regime which was bombarding his hometown. The upshot of this was that the uh, disinterest of Bosnia's Croats and uh, Serbs with the uh, national institutions of Bosnia afforded Bosniaks the country's film industry, essentially by default, as a means of national expression. Partially due to the new nationalist imperative to affirm the threatened Bosniak identity and partially as a means of practical survival, the multi-ethnicity of yesteryear was consigned to the past. The new agenda looked to emulate neighbouring nation-states in converting cinema into a decidedly national product. In Croatia, for instance, the 1990s was a period of national victimhood so intense that Pavle Levi terms it national necrophilia. In Serbia, economic sanctions led to the development of a characteristic Balkan aesthetic. This cynically served Serbian nationalist discourses by undermining national responsibility for the catastrophe enveloping the, uh, the region. Whilst each Yugoslav uh, successive state took a different approach, the new imperative was, and at that point mostly remains, for film to operate as a national institution that produces national narratives. The paradox here, of course, is that national audiences alone can't support the national film production, given how their viewings are so humble, the viewing figures are so humble, that is, and their long ingrained preference for Hollywood production product still remains. Instead, confirmation by Western audiences became the holy grail. Economically and ideology, ideologically, there was, and still remains, a need to invite visitors into the national cinema, to market the cinematic national to those from abroad, initially at festivals, and then, if possible, hopefully through more mainstream channels, such as cinema release. Against the odds, given the material damage and social disarray, which I've already mentioned, since the 2000s, it's been Bosnian productions, under the most international success out of all of Yugoslavia's successor states. And this is by considerable margin as well. Relying upon significant and in some cases absolute degrees of international cooperation in each instance, Danis Panovic's Nidia Zemlya claimed uh, an Academy Award, Golden Globe, and the Caesar. Uh, Yasmina Lubanic's Grbavica took home the honours from Berlin, and uh, Aida Begic's Sneg won in Cannes. This success, which certainly goes beyond uh, individual anomalies, was, as Yulica Bauchic notes, 
all the more astounding given that it originated from a country which uh, didn't have a single 35mm camera, a functioning studio or a laboratory and relied upon resources from other countries. Whilst Croatian and Serbian cinema generally took a pedagogic approach, hoping to favourably influence Western audiences and by using film as a medium for conveying their side of the story, Bosnian filmmakers have been more willing to submit to Western preconceptions of what their country should look like. As such, the price for taking these 30 pieces of silver from the Western partners in the form of funding has been an enforced submission to an orientalising discourse of faux authenticity, whereby Bosnians embrace their role as war-ravaged victims, quite literally performing for the Western gays. And this is the point at which I wish to bring in the concept of dark tourism, a term which was coined by John Lennon and Malcolm Foley in 1996, which refers to, as he says, the base in fact, uh, the, the, the phenomenon which encompasses the presentation and consumption by visitors of real and commodified death and disaster sites. So the most commonly cited example of this is the endless stream of foreign visitors to Auschwitz. Uh, the site is, of course, no longer an operating concentration camp, and visitors don't face any direct danger. But instead, they're drawn there by the tragic events which took place there in the past, and the sense of proximity which being there provides. Dark tourism in, uh, a much, is much broader, though, and uh, various attempts have been made to categorise the different forms which it can take, and the uh, various emotional responses which it elicits. These range, on the one hand, uh, from the distress felt by some of those touring Auschwitz, and the somberness of a visit to a First World War cemetery, to the curiosity of Western visitors to Chernobyl, and even entertainment which is promoted at attractions such as the London Dungeon. Uh, another aspect which shouldn't be overlooked is the commercialization of dark tourism sites, be that in the form of is it, uh, is it the theatres Anne Frank's Amsterdam mobile phone application, or just recently, in uh, a recent scandal this week, was the tackiness of the products on sale at the 9-11 Memorial Museum gift shop, which include iPhone cases and firefighter-themed clothes for dogs in a variety of different sizes. <laughs> but uh, dark tourism shouldn't always be assumed to be something quite so crass as this. There are always benefits which come from offering access points to broader audiences to the issues surrounding particular historical tragedies. Dark tourism certainly operates in Bosnia as well. It's not uncommon, for instance, to see tourists taking snaps of Sarajevo roses. These are the scars which are left in the pavement by exploding mortar shells that have then been filled with red resin to mark where one or more of the city's residents died. As you can see in the photo, sometimes they've come across as untasteful. Uh, less gratuitously, the cemetery at Bodhichari, where most of the victims of the Srebrenica massacre are buried, operates as a memorial and it features a book of condolences. So this invites an emotional reflection, even from visitors who have no direct link to the visitors who are to the victims, I'm sorry, who are buried there. In Bosnia, the ethnic components of the conflict's deaths, whereby victims were killed precisely on account of their ethnicity, means that sites of dark tourism simultaneously serve as national monuments, especially since they're never located too far from people who belong to the ethnicity which committed the crimes in case. This isn't dissimilar from the way in which films are colonised and collated into national cinemas, basically turning them into sort of temples of, uh, of the filmic national. Um, and it's in this case, uh, it's so in uh, the former Yugoslavia as well. And they're most obviously understood in contrast to their closest others. So we understand Croatian cinema as being different to Serbian, to being uh, different to Bosnian. We rarely compare it to, say, uh, Hungarian. As monuments, sites of dark tourism welcome visitors, offering them a preferred narrative, uh, which in the case of the Bosniaks, quite understandably, is a narrative of national victimhood. Sites of dark tourism are curated, either directly through exhibitions or indirectly through the way in which there's a, a presumed correct way to experience them, a route which should be followed. This is just the same with Bosnia's films, which provide highly curated interpretations of the Bosnian war experience. We don't view the entire situation, Rather, we're taken by the hand and led through a very specific construction of what the war should mean. So, if we think of Bosnia's recent films as cinematic sites of dark tourism, there are scant works which avoid looking at either the war itself or the di direct consequences of it from the perspective of Bosnian victimhood. These films operate in much the same way as dark tourism sites. 
tourist on a guided tour around San Diego sites of walk and gawk at the shrapnel scars on buildings and in fact feel quite genuinely touched by the narrative which is constructed for him by his guide. But then he'll return to his hotel and eventually leave the city and the country. Similarly, the uh, viewer of a Bosnian film in Western countries will watch the constructive narrative and possibly feel quite genuinely moved by what he sees on the screen before him, before then you know, leaving the cinema or just ejecting the DVD and carrying on with his life. Both sites of dark tourism and Bosnian feature films, whilst inspired by real events, offer in their current form an entirely constructed snapshot of a culture, something intended for consumption, a preferred, a preferred memorialization or a, a favored narrative. If we understand these as national narratives, the misleading implication conveyed to outsiders is that, on a day-to-day -day basis, the clocks seem to have stopped and Bosnians still, to, still seem to be living in the war. So I'll now give some examples of the curating which exists in three of the most successful Bosnian feature films <laughs> in recent years, ones that I've already referred to earlier on through their directors. So in Danis Tanovic's Nitya Zemlya, Four soldiers, so that's two Bosniaks and uh, two Serbs, find themselves stranded in a trench in no man's land. Uh, the film pays lip service to the concept of the overall tragedy of war for all those who are involved, yet it's very clear which side is being favoured. Despite being shown as individuals with faces and backstories rather than just faces of soldiers, the Serbs are depicted much more negatively than their Bosniak counterparts. Uh, one of the Serbs suffers an early death, managing beforehand quite sadistically to plant a mine underneath one of the unconscious Bosniaks. Um, unflatteringly, after his death, he's shown to have been carrying around some gay pornography. Uh, his compatriot is weedy, bald, and all the time neurotic. The Bosniaks, on the other hand, are considerably more handsome, and uh, one of them courts Western sensibilities by wearing a Rolling Stones t-shirt. Um, the other is depicted as the metaphorical Bosnian national victim as he's left to die upon the unexploded mine by the Westerners. Although the film is critical of Western political diplomacy, uh, Western viewers are courted through the likeable common characters of the intrepid British journalist, a swashbuckling French soldier, and the powerless German D miner who you know, didn't really like to take away the mine, he just can't. And who put it there? Obviously not one of the Westerns. Indeed, the message seems to be that whilst the West, the West cannot just come in and fix problems as it presumed, these problems only exist because of inherent primitiveness within the Balkans, a discourse which, which when placed under greater scrutiny, doesn't really deserve any serious consideration. Whilst Nietzsche then exhibits the actual conflict to the screen tourist, Ivor Begic's Snake is set in 1997 in its aftermath, with a remote Bosniak village's men folk having been killed in the war, and their bodies having yet to be uncovered, the women struggle to survive, torn between a sense of duty to preserve their endangered culture from oblivion, and a realisation that life would be much easier elsewhere. Matters are complicated when a rich foreign investor comes and makes a generous offer to buy their land en masse. Whilst the money would free them from their grim fiscal hardship, to which they are now bound, they would be forced to leave not only their family homes, but also the land where the bodies of their fallen husbands and sons likely lie. The offer is communicated to them through a serp who, despite being civil to them in their engagement, uh, fought with the enemy during the war. This gives the impression that the cleansing of the Bosniaks, which began through wartime murder, is now being completed by economic supremacy in peacetime. Although the dilemma isn't simple, the Western viewer, sat in the comfort of the cinema, with some popcorn and a drink, or at home in a comfy armchair, is nevertheless channeled towards siding with those who wish to doggedly stay in the unforgiving village. Without undermining the seriousness or pertinence of individual cases akin to that which is depicted in Sine, uh, it's problematic so much as it's conveyed as a national narrative, in which the very fate of the entire Bosnian nation seems to be at stake in this uh, one little village. The film's particular take on Bosnian victimhood uh, isn't one which matches the broad challenges of the present day, which more people would experience, those such as youth unemployment and institutional corruption, but rather it's one which is in keeping with post-colonial Western expectations of the post-war period. Bosnian women's struggle to remain is depicted as being noble and somehow more desirable, even though it's ultimately a losing battle, but they seem to be told to sort of, you know, stick it out and carry on with it. Bringing our dark tourism journey around Bosnia to, a, uh, to the contemporary period, to the present, uh, Jasmila Jovanic's Gerbavica is set in the mid-2000s, and 
and it's about a middle-aged Bosniak single mother who hides from her creepy, uh, sorry, not creepy best, her pubescent daughter, the fact that she was born as the result of a wartime rape by a Serbian soldier. Having brought up the daughter to believe that her father died as a Muslim martyr during the war, the mother does everything to avoid having to reveal the secret to her, until eventually they must confront with the uh, traumatic truth. Commendably, the film raises awareness of gender-orientated violence, which often gets overlooked in this, uh, in this neck of the woods. However, the film um, ends too conveniently, with the mother and the daughter being reconciled in a way which is fitting for a casual Western viewer, who will then move on from Bosnia and travel elsewhere on his cinematic journey. As a national narrative with pretensions beyond the immediacy of its main characters, much seems to have been left unaddressed. For instance, what future does the troubled daughter now face amongst her judgmental Bosniak peers at school? And what about the fates of the other women from the uh, rape support group which the mother attends? So, Bosnian cinema isn't unique either in the former Yugoslavia or further afield as we heard with uh, talk about Russian cinema in dealing with the subject of war. What separates it and sets it apart, however, is the thematic dominance of the conflict and the success which this has then imparted upon Bosnian cinema. Three films which I've touched on this paper serve as one potential itinerary through a dark tourism of Bosnia's contemporary cinema, but others are, of course, available. Whilst the films broadly confirm Bosniak views of the conflict and oppose those of the close other, the Serbs, uh, to the extent that Gerbabica didn't even receive cinematic release in Bosnia's Serbian entity. More importantly, they conform to the dominant discourses held by Western viewers. Whilst the kind less depictions of Serbian cinema match Western prejudices of the war during the 1990s as a chaotic, chaotic uh, fratricidal bloodbath, the shit subsequently occurred in favour of Bosniak victimhood as the key narrative for understanding the former Yugoslavia in Western countries. For better or for worse, the co-alignment of this, changing uh, Western readings of the conflict, Bosniak control of the national film industry, and a willingness to make films matching Western preconceptions permitted the unlikely uh, rise and also subsequent preeminence of Bosnian cinema within the region. That's all. Thank you very much.